Good morning, everyone. My name is Adrian Ackerley, and I'm your host today. To help us avoid any unnecessary background noise, may I ask, if you've not already done so, please enter your audio pin that you will find on the right side of your screen. You simply press the pound sign, then the number listed, and then the pound sign again directly into your phone. Or if you wish, you can just hit, simply hit the mute button on your own phone. Welcome to today's webinar. This webinar is geared to take approximately 40 to 45 minutes as we know that your time is valuable. Once we have completed, we will open it up to a short Q&A section. So please hold your questions until then, or if you want, you can simply type them in on the right side of your screen and we will address them after the presentation. If you notice in the GoToMeeting panel, there is a chat box. As you think of your questions, just jot them down and, and we'll take care of them at the end. Our pro presenters for today's webinar are Mark Stillman and John Vrabel. Mark is a co-founder of Energy Engine, as well as president of Energy Edge Advisor Group, a management consulting firm which provides a broad range of services to participants in the downstream energy space. Mark is a student of the energy industry who continually studies the changing dynamics of this exciting marketplace to help position dealers and technology vendors for the future. Mark has a broad professional background with specialties in strategic planning, finance, product, head product hedging, and executive management. John Vrabel is the president and co-founder of Energy Engine. As a career-long business development expert, John understands the necessity of focusing on the consumer to achieve sustainable business success. That discipline, along with his experience running energy businesses, has driven the design and ongoing development of the energy engine. As an early internet pioneer, first with electric and natural gas utilities, and then downstream fuels, John continues to push the technology to keep pace with today's consumers. Consequently, the work of the energy engine partners has resulted in more online fuel sales than anyone by far. Through these webinars, we all hope to shed a fresh perspective on the emerging challenges facing our energy industry, stimulate a meaningful dialogue, and sometimes even challenge the conventional thinking of our, of our attendees. Mark, on over to you. Adrian, thanks. And good morning, everyone. Thanks for taking the time. <clears throat> we know it's a really busy uh, situation we're living through. Uh, we have a nice mix on the phone today of of dealers and other technology partners that help uh, companies like Energy Engine uh, serve uh, the, the dealer community. So welcome to all. We're gonna quickly go through uh, an introduction this morning about some of, uh, I don't wanna make this a typical, hey, what can we learn from COVID? But um, it's more about uh, what it's doing for consumers and how that is affecting uh, dealers uh, in the space. And then really the, the meat of today is John is gonna go through some um, sort of market-wide data, how this situation is affecting industries uh, similar to ours, and then how it is directly impacting fuel dealers um, from a consumer perspective. Uh, what gives us the ability to do that is the Energy Engine is an e-commerce app, uh, and it lives in the cloud, and even though our customers run their own businesses and use this, our software, we're not in the fuel business, but we do have access to data and metrics across uh, countless hundreds of thousands of fuel and propane customers across the U.S. Um, our clients range from one truck operators to some of the largest uh, MLP uh, publicly traded companies. Um, so we have a really broad reach into the consumer side um, and do a lot of research, especially John uh, and I do a lot of research into what consumers are doing. Um, so that's what we hope to do today. But in, uh, I'm going to quickly preamble uh, for John. Um, uh, a little bit about what's going on here and some of the effects on on consumers. I've seen a lot of webinars pop up in the last few weeks, and it's a great tool for vendors to use to reach uh, dealers at a time when every show has been canceled at this point. Um, so I don't want, I don't want to rehash too much, but what I have seen is a lot of internal focus in what you can be doing as a business, which is important internally. But I think the consumer changes might be as or more important because a lot of those changes are here to stay. Uh, the at-home consumer won't be at home forever, obviously, um, but the habits that they're picking up in, in an extraordinarily short amount of time are going to live on, um, and we're going to have to adjust to those as a community of not only dealers but of vendors. 
First, a quick thank you. Obviously, uh, fuel dealers are in the essential services business. A lot of us have the luxury of working from home uh, and attempting to homeschool our kids, which is always a challenge with teenagers, um, speaking from personal experience. Uh, but fuel dealers do not have that luxury. They have to go out and do business. Their customers rely on them. Um, so uh, we thank you. Uh, there are some interesting heroes that have emerged in this situation. Um, fuel dealers, convenience stores, certainly on that list of companies who have showed up in a big way uh, for consumers in need. So, uh, you know, we are in an un unimaginable world, right? We Nobody needs to know uh, for me about how difficult the COVID-19 pandemic has been for the U.S., for the businesses in the U.S., um, for people around the world, and sadly, lots of people who are suffering uh, uh, in this situation. Uh, but the end result has really created um, an environment where we're locked down. My daughter is 15 years old. She says it feels like science fiction or she's living in, the, in an Orwell 1984 movie. I don't think she's wrong. We, we are social distancing. We're disconnected from everything. We have been disconnected from the ways of doing business, the ways that we interact with our family and our friends. We can't visit grandmas and grandpas really been a huge, huge um, paradigm shift for us as a society. Suddenly going to the grocery store, leaving the house is about the riskiest thing that we're all doing. It feels crazy. Um, but through all of this, we are still a consumer-driven society. Our economy is based upon buying things. That's what we do. So how do we lock down and disconnect and still uh, be consumers? Well, the first thing that we've done is what Google has termed dynamic reprioritization, which means we're all changing and reprioritizing our lives uh, in, in minute to minute fashion. Um, I think our everyday life has obviously been changed. Um, we are reprioritizing how we spend our money, how we spend our time, where we spend our time. Um, we are, in terms of our consumption, because again, we're consumers, We've had to completely reinvent, I guess rethink might be an understatement, how, when, where, and why we do that. Um, we, are, we are doing curbside, we are doing you know, locker generated pickups at, at big box stores. We're using Amazon so much that Amazon uh, can't keep up. And, um, and that, is, that is changing our perspective on how we buy. Value is really important. We, you know, it's a, when, in, when you live in a world where you pay $100 for three ounces of uh, Purell hand sanitizer, uh, value becomes very important for consumers and gets shifted. We're stockpiling. Uh, we're also stockpiling fuel. As John will talk about in a minute, we saw a surge in a record surge in consumers going through e-commerce to buy and fill their tank in March and April because, yeah, there was a genuine fear. But the biggest thing that we're reprioritizing is we're all, me included, you included, taking a very hard look about who we rely on um, for, for must-have products and services. But the people that we're doing business with are going to be there for us at a time when we're actually scared. And we have bona fide evidence to prove that some supply chains have broken. Some retailers and services providers have fallen down and has left some of us vulnerable at times. So uh, that fear is real. So brand, which is more than your pretty logo uh, in your tagline, brand is your emotional connection to your customers, your reputation, your values. You know, do you have the strength and reliability to show up? You're being judged now more than ever because people see certainly fuel dealers as a lifeline. This isn't something that can break. Uh, heat, hot water, um, air conditioning, all the things that provide comfort and security for my family must show up. But they don't want just stuff from you. If you look at some of the research that's being done, and there's tons of it out there, and we did a lot of prep for this meeting and for other meetings that we're doing. Um, consumers want information. They feel uh, a little bit uh, in a vacuum. They want people that they do business with. They want brands to become a resource. They want to learn from you. They want you to counsel them. Um, we are hearing a lot from our customers about uh, phone calls and email chats and text conversations about um, the best way to handle uh, fuel buying, the best way to take advantage of the low prices, um, the best way to ensure supply that, you know, are you guys going to run out? Are you going to have enough propane? So counsel and information are really, really important. Omnichannel, 
it's a kind of a geeky word, but the idea is you want to have a unified experience. You need to have multiple ways to do business. Eight to four telephone-based business in this world has or was already 10 minutes ago, and now it's 10 hours ago. The this this crisis has wanted uh, caused people to want to go online, but they want to have the same experience with you that they have when they call up. But they're doing it at all kinds of crazy hours, right? And then this local, local, local thing is not just about food and farmers and meat and milk. It's about consumers genuinely respecting and feeling comfortable about doing business with someone who is local, that they can reach out and touch. Um, it feels more reliable. It is more reliable. You are more accessible. Um, and I think that that has become a really important re sort of... <laughs> It's sort of a restatement of part of our long-term value prop as an industry that that local community thing is important. Well, it just proved how important it is. So that kind of segues into, you know, the good news of this is that fuel dealers are clearly well positioned. As an industry, you know, we know that we're recession proof and people always need fuel. Um, and even the people that uh, might be on the phone yesterday, there was a bunch of folks on the phone in the C-Store business. Um, even they became uh, sort of an oasis for consumers who didn't want to go to the big grocery store, who needed a few things, who needed gasoline. So we are well positioned as an industry. Not only are we recession proof and consumers need us, but this is what we do, right? We're essential. Fuel dealers show up. We all have a million war stories about hurricanes and blizzards and natural disasters of all kinds and fuel shortages and you know, supply chain problems and propane, and, and we do it. We manage to show up, and we don't let our customers down, and we're doing it again. And, you know, we're in the contactless business. I When I first started hearing about contactless, I had never heard that word before, along with a million other words I've heard in the last uh, eight weeks. You know, the other than service calls, which, again, are done in an environment where, you know, your service techs often wear little booties and we're making sure houses stay clean and we're cleaning up after ourselves. We're in the contactless business already. We're able to deliver mission critical um, services and products to our customers um, with very little human contact. So that's, that's um, you know, a big part of our story. I think consumers appreciate that. Again, back to the age-old historical value prop, reliability, security, local. Yeah, it means something, right? And consumers have been reminded that it means something. We have a strong supply chain, and we're community-based, right? So um, at a time when people want to not just feel comfortable with business, but if you look at the research, they have great empathy for what businesses are going through. I go out of my way to buy as much takeout food from local restaurants as I can, to do business with my local hardware store as much as I can. These people are suffering, right? And uh, we have uh, sort of a, a responsibility to help them out. And, um, and I think your customers feel the same way about you. Like you've always been there for them and maybe they didn't appreciate it as much. But, you know, this crisis has, <laughs> I think, if you could sum it all up in, in one word, it has exposed vulnerabilities uh, as a society, uh, as our government, our health infrastructure. We have things that we need to improve, and we may be the greatest country in the world, and I happen to believe that, but we need to learn that we have vulnerabilities, and dealers do too. And I'm not trying to draw uh, unusual parallels between the, the challenges of frontline healthcare workers and fuel dealers. But I think the lessons here are, where are those vulnerabilities? Where did things break, right? I think that in our industry, if I was being um, constructive and not being judgmental, which I am, is that we don't have a great online engagement history. It's a weakness for the industry. We haven't done a good job at embracing online engagement. Uh, Self-service has sort of been defined by some dealers about 35% by recent research using portals, which are great for full service and, and established customers, but taking payments is not online engagement. That's really something that happened 15 years ago. It's not new, it just seems like it's new to us. We need to strengthen self-service options. We know that customers are frustrated by a lack of technology that they can use to self-service. Um, you know, there's uh, lots of apps out there within the industry. There are tank monitor companies that um, are using apps and stuff, but you know the, the dealers are, have been slow to adapt, uh, adopt some of these, and it's making customers frustrated. They use technology everywhere else they do business. 
um, but there's very little of that that they can use in this industry, and it's, it's, it's been a problem. And then this situation has only amplified that problem. Um, I think communication is key. I think we kind of lived in a world for a long time where the fuel dealers, I was on that side of the business um, when I first got into energy in the late 90s as well. So I know what it's like. If you have an automatic delivery customer or a keep fill propane customer, you really don't talk to them very much, right? They get their fuel, they pay their bill, everything is easy. They might need a service call or cleaning once a year. Um, but, you know, that is not a way to keep a sticky customer. We talk a lot about stickiness and, and attrition and retention. Communication is the key to that. But communication can't be done by the phone. It can't be done by snail mail. It has to be done digitally. It has to be done with some kind of tool, whether it's portal, whether it's e-commerce, whether it's tank monitors, whether it's a marketing system, something has to stay in touch with your customers. Communication voids are bad. Digital first is really a fancy way of saying that consumers, when they think of buying something, when they think of engaging somebody to buy or to look into buying something, they want to do it on their phone. They might want to do it on their laptop or tablet, but these days it's got to be on their phone. Um, we are not a digital first industry. We are a phone first industry. Um, and that's just not going to work. Uh, consumers are going to get very tired of that um, very quickly. And this situation is only going to make that worse. We were already playing catch up. And uh, now we have to just run faster because the world has changed so much in such an immensely short amount of time. So we know that e-commerce is the new normal. I don't think there's a single person on this phone who hasn't had to or wanted to um, use e-commerce in the last eight weeks, uh, whether that's restaurants or things that you would never thought you would use for e-commerce. It is, it is the new normal. This is going to be the future, is that a lot of these habits are here to stay. If we think that we're going to go back to the old way of doing business, it just won't happen. Consumers aren't going to go backwards. Consumers are only going to move forward. Uh, the easier, the better. The more convenient, the better. The less friction, the better. The less hassle, the better. That's kind of the world that they're living in. And in some ways, our model, although really proud in terms of how we're delivering community-based business, we're kind of stuck a little bit. Uh, in in a past time that that's not ever coming back um the acceleration of this exponential uh it's universal e-commerce has become something everybody has to do now it's the first thing they think of how can i do this online on my phone senior citizens we often hear from dealers uh, senior citizens don't use the web first of all 85 percent of senior citizens use the web every day that's mythology um and they use it more than gen xers uh, and But in terms of doing business, they have emerged as a driving force. They're a very vulnerable population, and they are becoming technology experts in, in pushing online engagement uh, more than any category at the moment. Um, and these digital first things, are these are conditioned, right? So this is not, well, maybe I can do it online. Now everybody's mind is, I'm doing it online. And if you don't let me do it online, then we're going to have a problem. I'll find somebody who can help me do it online. So, you know, e-commerce sort of as a concept is confusing to people because you could sort of broadly define it as anything that's done online in terms of your business that's transactional. Consumers don't see it that way. Consumers see you taking a payment online through a portal as, eh, I guess that's okay because it's quicker than I don't want to deal with just calling somebody up. And I don't, I have, I don't know the last time I wrote a check. I haven't written a check in five years. Um, so uh, I think that e-commerce is bigger. It's more about building a digital relationship, having a platform in place where your customers can buy from you, can learn from you, can be communicated with in bi-directional ways, um, be thanked for things, be texted reminders. That kind of relationship um, is tough to find uh, in, the, in the heating and propane business, but we need to get there. So these three questions came to mind as a way for me to lead into John's section here. Um, I think the first thing is, you know, customers are evolving by the minute. You know, how are you providing help? How are you, how are you keeping pace with these needs? What are you doing? How are you adjusting, right? And then how are you adjusting to a 24 seven consumption cycle? Um, that people are doing business off hours. We've been looking at our clients' data and realizing that a lot of people are ordering in the middle of the night, one, two, three o'clock in the morning, they're ordering oil and propane. 
Um, it's really, really important to know that. It's not like, oh gosh, I missed the four o'clock, I'll, 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 I'll call tomorrow. Uh, no, they're doing it in the middle of the night. And most importantly, are you embracing technology um, that is meeting a rising bar? Consumer expectations had already become uh, rarefied air, but now they are gonna be way out there. And when the dust settles from this situation, Consumers know that they're in the driver's seat. They're gonna demand more of you than they've ever demanded before. And are you ready for that? Can you make those adjustments? So with that, John, I'll pitch it to you to talk about how the folks can make those adjustments. Hey, thanks, Mark. And, um, and thanks, for, thanks for that setup. Um, that's, that's perfect. And, and, and thank you all for joining us um, this morning. Um, my job here is a little bit easier than Mark's uh, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply some of what Mark just said to you to real life examples uh, in terms of answering those three questions that Mark just had up on the screen. So we're going to we're going to we're going to draw upon those three questions, and I think uh, as we're going through, you know, you can ask yourself, okay, in your particular circumstance with your particular business, what in fact are you doing to answer those three questions for the consumer? Um, and consequently, um, how you might um, uh, how you might look at this new normal that Mark just talked about, uh, as far as e-commerce being the new normal, digital engagement being the new normal. So with that, the first uh, example I'm going to draw upon is um, is that that um, big box retailer uh, with the bright orange called Home Depot that we're all familiar with. And uh, what they have done, um, if you look at question number one that Mark posed, how are you providing help to consumers uh, as their needs evolve? Well, certainly Home Depot has done that over the years, matter of fact, decades now in terms of uh, digital engagement with their customers. Um, you know, initially starting with uh, HomeDepot.com, the ability to search and buy products online. As that moved forward, um, not only were products purchased online, and ship to you, but um, you know now, of course, you can order them online, have them um, delivered to the store for pickup or shipped home. You have that choice. Um, or now they've uh, gone through the sophistication of linking their store inventories in real time uh, to the online capability. So now you can see if you're purchasing that product, if it's available in the store, if it is, you can order it from the store have them pick it for you, put that order together, and go to the store and pick it up. So that's kind of been the progression for them. Now they've gone a step further, and this picture uh, actually represents one store um, where they have these pickup lockers that, uh, that Mark mentioned at the very beginning of his presentation as a new advance. Um, and this was, this was in stores prior to our global pandemic. Uh, so uh, Home Depot was uh, going in this direction. What that does is it, pay, it takes their, their pickup service and this digital engagement that we're talking about to yet the next level. Because what Home Depot found out was um, customers were liking this, this, this pick, it up, pick it up in the store, going online, placing the order. They don't have to go down the aisles, uh, pick their products and so forth. They'll be waiting for them. They can go in. Uh, they, can, they can pick them up, check out. They're on their way. Um, what happened was uh, consumers realized, okay, the front end of that process was extremely convenient. I could do all this thing online, could even pay online. Um, but then I got to the store and things kind of broke down because I had to stand in line at the service counter. It took a little while to do that, particularly if there were other people in front of you with a, with a, with a problem that just took some of the time for the, for the attendant. Um, and then you finally got your turn. And if you had a big product that you, that you picked up, it was something large, um, there wasn't any room uh, around the customer service um, desk in the front of the store, so they had to get someone to go to the back room and find your product, which took a little while, and you could have been standing there for 15 minutes waiting for somebody to get the product to finally put it in your vehicle to get it home. So pickup lockers were born, um, and these pickup lockers have been tested. They, uh, they are expanding. Um, with the onset of the global pandemic, and the need for this further acceleration of digital engagement, Home Depot has now committed to accelerating what had been a three-year rollout program to get these um, lockers in several different configurations, actually, into their stores uh, quicker than they had originally planned. 
because what it does is it's taking that digital engagement all the way through so it's convenient for the customer and it really answers question number two how are you adjusting to the 24 7 consumption cycle home depot is doing it with these lockers because these lockers are now available to consumers even when the store is closed 24 hours a day seven days a week you take your receipt with qr code you go into the locker um, identify yourself uh, it opens up the locker you take your product um, you go you're on your way 100 percent touchless um in in and during this particular time um uh, obviously touchless has become something that is important and for consumers to have that added digital engagement that provides them with everything that they need and now the advantage of speed convenience and also being touchless for that particular group of customers is extremely important so this is a journey that Home Depot has been on for their customers in terms of digital engagement. And Lana Johnson, who's their director of corporate communications, explained it this way, quite simply, it's customers' expectations with shopping are changing. And they want as many options as you can possibly give them. And that's absolutely true. E-commerce, if we relate it back to our industry, to the fuels industry, is just another option for the customer to engage with us. And um, the, the data that we have been watching for years now, matter of fact, better than a decade, um, all supports that when you give customers more options to be able to engage with you, particularly digitally, your business will in fact benefit from it. So let's move on to the next example. This draws us a little bit closer to home. It puts us in the energy industry. And uh, what that visual is, if you've never looked at one of these things closely, is a smart meter. You probably have it on your home or you have it on your business. Um, it literally is a, um, a meter that, uh, that is a two-way communicator. It collects data. It also is a transmitter. So it sends out information, sends information back to your utility um, in, in real time, um, real time increments or in, time, in terms of timed uh, communications. So it is on 24 seven um, and provides two way communications. Um, it's been something that's been around for uh, better than 20 years now is when all of this started. Uh, so they've been working at it for some time. And, and um, uh, what has happened and originally, and I had actually had personal involvement because before coming to this part of the energy uh, industry, coming to liquid fuels uh, 20 years ago now, I was part of utility scale uh, energy. Um, so, so, so I was there when, when this was always getting started. And it was looked at as an operational improvement, an operational enhancement for the utilities. Think about this. This is really, this device, it's just like um, a monitor for, for heating oil and propane or distillate tanks. It's, it's literally a monitor. It collects data and transmits information. That's, a, that's what it does. The utility industry thought about it the same way we think about monitors for the most part today, is it allows our business to be, to, to be uh, uh, more efficient. Maybe we can um, uh, make deliveries uh, more efficiently by knowing exactly what the fuel level is it in the tank. So, um, so maybe you make less deliveries to a customer over the course of the year. Uh, all of that is very re real. It's very um, quantifiable. Uh, it provides financial justification for the investments and so forth. That's how the utility was looking at the smart meter as well. What happened though, was that shifted just a number of years ago. So yes, it's providing the operational efficiency, but now the utilities have learned with that data, we can provide these consumer facing benefits um, that really are paying big benefits for them today. Matter of fact, that quote that's it's on the smart meter there. Smart meters are emerging as a potential game changer that are revitalizing the entire electric industry because electric utilities can now make one-on-one -on -one personal relationships with their customers by providing, providing them with, the, the, with these consumer-focused benefits um, like customized usage comparisons. How does your usage in your home or your business compare to other similar sized homes in your neighborhood? Um, how do you improve upon that efficiency? Here are the suggestions. And if you have any questions, give us a call at this number, send us an email. We'll help you 
uh, operate your home more efficiently. Time of use savings, um, uh, some areas of the country um, uh, made po possible by smart meters. Now we'll give you a better rate on, on your electricity overnight uh, than they do during the day, encouraging um, shifting of the load so the generation plants can operate more efficiently. Outage recognition. I had this happen in my particular case at the very beginning of our COVID um, stay at home, shelter in place um, orders where there was an outage that actually wasn't experienced at our house, it was experienced on our community um, water system uh, where our pumps stopped, stopped pumping water to the, uh, to the community. I happen to sit on our, our, uh, the board of our water co-op and um, uh, uh, I didn't even realize we were without water until I was alerted by the president of the co-op. And uh, about the time, same time he was alerting me, I got another text from my utility it let me know that there was an outage at our um, at our pumping station, and um, let me know what time it took place. Let me know how many meters were impacted. It happened to be a small outage, um, which was good news to me because they can respond to a small outage and correct the problem easier than they can if it's a much larger outage. Um, and uh, and they estimated the time of restoration at about three hours down the road. So we were then able to communicate uh, to all of the members, the water co-op members, letting them know they're without power that particular, or without water that particular morning because of that power outage. Um, all happened unassisted, complete, absolute digital engagement based upon these smart meters. What, that, what then happened that either even boosted it and made it even more impressive was not three hours, but one hour later, got a notification on my cell phone, popped up says, hey, your power's been restored. Sure enough, check the water. Water was coming out of the faucets. Um, all was good. Um, they they uh, uh, set expectations. They over-delivered, uh, made me feel good. And then also, not only told me the power was back on, but said what the cause was, that it was an animal that actually contacted the power system, which caused uh, caused the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the trip. Um, and then... Uh, uh, also said, hey, if for some reason you don't have power, you don't see what looks like we're seeing because our our smart meter was saying we have power again. Here's what you do: call this number, text us this, and we'll investigate further. A complete 360 two-way communication um, that provided us with with absolute convenience without ever having to pick up a phone, report an outage call back, find out when it was going to be restored, all the things that we used to do years ago. Uh, so that our electric utility now is looking a whole lot friendlier than they used to in the past. They are, in fact, um, gaining the hearts, the attention, the, 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 uh, um, the relationship with customers, um, and consequently making them formidable competitors for our industry as well. Here's the other thing about it. The last point there, the last bullet point, smart meters today are in 68% of homes across the country, and it is, and they anticipate that they'll be at better than 80% of homes by 2024, just four years down the road. By comparison, in fuels industry, uh, heating oil tanks, about 15% of them only have monitors. Propane is slightly more, but still well behind what one of our major competitors has done in terms of um, uh, fortifying their business by using um, digital engagement technology. So let's move on. Let's move on to the, th the third example, and let's bring it let's bring it home entirely. Let's bring it to our business, to 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 fuel marketers who are primarily the audience that's on the phone this morning. We're going to look again at these three answers. The first question was, how are you providing help to consumers as their needs evolve? And we want to share with you um, information, uh, actual data that we have pulled, as Mark mentioned, opening up, that we have access to, to data on hundreds of um, uh, clients in terms of uh, e-commerce um, uh, data and transactions. And, and, and customers expect from our industry they absolutely do. This is the new normal, the same level of interactive online engagement they get elsewhere. Okay, why would they give us a break? Why would they make it less convenient for themselves? If they're doing business with another industry, another business somewhere else, on their smartphone, on their laptop, on their tablet, 
they expect to do the same thing with us. They want to be able to go online and become a customer to register. They want to place their orders. They want to pay online, obviously, and they want to know when their delivery is coming. So that two-way communications becomes very critical. Thanks for your order. We expect we're going to make the delivery on this date. And then when they make the delivery, you tell them, you confirm they made the delivery. What was delivered? How much did they pay? Maybe they ordered 200 gallons of heating oil. You only delivered 180, so you had to put a credit on their account. It's all automated. That sort of interactive two-way communications is absolutely vital uh, to, to that digital engagement with the customer. Um, so, so one of the things, what we've seen now for better than 10 years as we've been, been building and monitoring this database and tracking this performance is every year um, uh, online uh, gallons in liquid fuels have been the single largest segment of growth that's available to fuel marketers as more people go online and want to engage with you online. And we know, um, you know, looking at our industries, heating oil, propane, really the same uh, with, a, with a few variations, but they're not growing industries in terms of gallons, except when you look at online gallons. So the numbers over to the right of this last heating season from October through March, and you can see that uh, um, orders and gallons were up 3%, 2% respectively. Not a huge percentage increase, but keep in mind, this was a very warm winter, right? One of the warmest we've had on records with degree days being negative 15% to 18% in the Northeast where we're located. Um, uh, so consequently, that 3% growth, that 2% growth in orders and gallons with that differential in degree days becomes significant. And, uh, you know, on, on, in the years when degree days have been somewhere close to normal, we're typically seeing the e-commerce networks and the total gallons increase by 20% or so. So the differential here is pretty consistent with that. Registrations, which is analogous to, to new customers, was about even. But we'll talk about that as we move forward to these, um, uh, to these next two slides. So the next question was how are you adjusting to the new 24-7 consumption cycle? One of the interesting things, um, and if you look at survey data, the ability for customers to shop 24-7 is the number one reason why consumers shop online. Matter of fact, 58% of consumers uh, say, hey, that's the number one reason I shop on top online, because I can do it when I want it from wherever I am. Um, and that's very important to them, obviously. Um, on the comment that he made in terms of consumers wanting to buy and, and, and customers, uh, propane customers, heating oil customers, um, placing orders um, uh, throughout the entire day. So we broke out the volume across the entire network to non-business hours. And we're surprised that it's a strong, matter of fact, slightly more than a third of the business is done when your offices are closed. So thinking about it another way, how much business do you risk losing when your office isn't open because you, if you do not have some sort of digital engagement platform working for your customers? Um, and we'll come back to these numbers a little bit uh, differently in just a, uh, another slide or two. So let's move on to the third question. How are you embracing technology to meet the rising bar of customer expectations? And as Mark pointed out during the introduction, absolutely, in the last 60 days, we have seen an acceleration of digital engagement much faster than anything we've ever seen in history as, as we've been in what I've termed this COVID-19 state of mind. Um, uh, we know what we have seen through the numbers is online engagement improves results because customers embrace that digital engagement. In some cases, it was their lifeline. We've done recent um, uh, research looking at other industries um, from, from telemedicine, Mark mentioned curbside um, uh, pickup services, certainly retail uh, we looked at and so, and so forth. 
and and it became it became the lifeline in some cases in other cases it caused consumers to try something that they had not previously tried before telemedicine has become huge in terms of digital engagement and literally millions of people in the course of 60 days have tried it for the first time and like it customer communication is critical it has to be that two-way communication uh, between your system and the customer and back from the customer to your system. Um, so, so we looked at, um, um, uh, we looked at the uh, different time frame now, um, kind of a, the COVID-19 state of mind period, uh, the way that I'm thinking about it, which really started about March 1st. It, it wasn't real to me, you know, it was in the news. Things were going on uh, in other parts of the country. We weren't quite sure where we were, but things were starting to get serious here um, uh, as, as we got into mid-March, certainly. So we ran this data from, from March 1st to May 1st um, and, and share that with you, although uh, while this just ran through May 1st, we know that this data and these same trends are continuing into May. We don't know how long they'll, they'll, they'll go, but they are continuing at this point. For that period of time, orders were up 33%, and gallons uh, followed it exactly at a 33% increase compared to that same period of last year. Now, when we first looked at that, for some other reasons, we said, all right, we expected um, that gallons were going to be up compared to last year, the same period, for two reasons. One, um, temperatures were a little bit cooler, um, uh, particularly through, through March and through a lot of April. So we had some degree days, so we would get more orders. The other thing was, was um, um, fuel prices certainly have been attractive this year, and many of the marketers that we deal with were encouraging their customers to, to top off their tanks as they came out of the system based upon the favorable prices. So we expected the increase. But let's focus on that, on that, um, on that third number over there to the right. That's 68% of new customer registrations, which obviously greatly exceeds the growth that we saw or our clients saw in terms of orders and gallons. What we found was, and this began, or at least the first time we noticed it was about mid-March, where new customer registrations coming to clients via digital options to be able to buy 24 7 online was was most unusual particularly for this time of the year we're at the end of the heating season where you're not getting nearly as many new customers as you do generally that's done uh, um, on the front end or through the heating season but all of a sudden had customers that were um, interested in in engaging with fuel dealers digitally for the first time giving up the relationships, and as we checked with our, with our clients for more definitive information, customers that were giving up relationships that they may have had with their fuel supplier for long periods of time, but they said, I want that digital engagement. So I went to Google, um, I, I found out who was selling um, online, went there and had this experience, and consequently, um, uh, e-commerce enabled uh, clients were able to capture customers by the thousands, literally, um, during this period. So strong growth and, 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 and validation of that move toward digital engagement at a faster rate than we've ever seen before. So with that um, in mind, I'm, before I turn it back to Mark to kind of summarize our day today, um, I make, um, make an offer uh, to you that, that's, uh, um, that's a genuine offer. Um, if you are engaging your clients um, on some sort of e-commerce uh, platform today and you're not seeing the same type of results that we uh, mentioned here, feel free to reach, reach out to us. Uh, email us, um, text us, give us a call, um, whatever is convenient for you. Um, we'll gladly um, you know, talk with you about that. Uh, typically, the cause of that is easily identified and the remedy is, uh, is generally equal, equally simple, simple as well. We're glad to, to help you with that and point you in the right direction. And if you're not using e-commerce today and you're exploring um, you know, what the future of your business needs to be, um, again, we invite you to you know, reach out, just to have a conversation with us for information 
um, you know, as you contemplate a transition, just kind of fill in some of the gaps and give you some of the knowledge, um, you know, to help you, you know, make an informed decision anyway. We're glad to help with that process. This is important to us and obviously important to your business. So with that, Mark, I'm going to turn it back to you to wrap up today for us. Great, John. Thank you. That was great. Um, yeah, I think the, the, the short summary here is that uh, the world has been forever changed and consumers are going to come out of this situation and they will and we will get back and we have fought back from many things in our history, but when they come out, they're really going to be different. Their expectations are going to be different. Their view is going to be different. And I think their demands are going to be different. You really should become students of this. You should start to understand and learn and go online and read about what large research firms or retailers are doing. It's not about your competitors. We need to break the cycle of thinking that your customers are simply judging you by your competitors. They're not anymore. In fact, that's probably the last place they're looking. They're judging you more around other experiences they're getting elsewhere. Um, and you are going to be expected to deliver a superior online engagement, not just an okay online engagement. Um, so I think getting ahead of it is smart, you know, but you know, this dealer community has proven to be tough and resilient and intelligent. And I think we are all well positioned to adapt to this consumer if we just make a few, a uh, couple of small changes. If we can help be part of that, that's great. Um, there'll be a recording of this sent out um, to all of you and all the people that came yesterday. I'm happy to answer questions, as John said. Uh, above all, we'd like you to stay safe and healthy. That's the most important thing to take care of your families. So we appreciate your time. John, there are a couple of quick, quick questions. Um, maybe you can field uh, the first one here. We get this a lot. We got this one yesterday as well. In fact, I think we get it every time we do a presentation. Maybe uh, a one minute summary of why portals and e-commerce are, are not the same beast. I think a lot of folks kind of homogenize those two two things together. So maybe if you can tease out some of those differences, it would help a couple of people on the call today. Yeah, sure. And um yeah, we do we do get that um a lot because there's there's similarities there. They're both um uh, attached to your websites and so forth. They're both consumer facing. Um portals are great. You need a portal um uh, for sure if you're doing traditional business, especially if you have full service customers. Um the uh, the portals the number one use for a portal uh, by far is uh, is for online bill payment. Uh, so your full service customers can go over there, pay their bills, maybe um, what we used to refer to as automatic will call customers. Um, also, you may be extending credit to and they have to, to go online to be able to pay the bill. That's where, for, where they should go. The same customers if they need be can manage their accounts and so forth. Those are the two primary uses for portals, but they're for a different customer. Therefore, that customer that's that's is your full service customer um the e-commerce platforms are for those self-service customers that mark talked about they're the customers that that are buying from you as we refer to now on demand what we used to call will call or cod um but they're determining uh what their needs are they're monitor they're monitoring their own tanks um unless they have some sort of an electronic device on it to do it for them but they are self-service. They are they are making sure that they get the, the delivery when they do it. They're going online also. Uh, they're connecting off of your website to place an order. Um, they're determining how many gallons um, um, you know they'd like to have delivered. Uh, you're providing price transparency to them so that they can in fact um, you know see what they're paying. Um, they're paying online, okay? So they're not going to get a bill. Um, matter of fact, your your money is going to be in the bank before your truck leaves the yard. Um, so so it's a very different customer uh, that uses a portal compared to the customer that engages with you online to make their purchases, um, to manage their own deliveries, um, uh, to to uh, uh, view their account, uh, to make sure that they got the proper credit if the number of gallons wasn't delivered and so forth. So it's, a, it's actually a much more interactive customer than your full service customers are because their limited needs are, or their needs are more limited online. The on-demand customer, um, is a more highly digitally engaged customer just because of the nature of the transactions that they're doing with you. So they're, that's why that's the customer that needs the e-commerce platform. Mark, do you want to add anything to that? No, I think that's really great.
I think uh, I think we can wrap it up with that. But, uh, um, again, thanks to everyone for their time. We appreciate it, and uh, hope to talk to you soon. And have a great day. Thanks, everyone.